Well, there's a challenge. <laughs> I'm, I'm a bit overwhelmed, to be honest. I mean, to see so many familiar faces from so many places, and people have come some of them an awful long way to be here uh, today, even from the United States. We've got people here from uh, the Netherlands and Spain and so on, friends and colleagues. Um, and, uh, uh, well, anyway, without further ado, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what I'm going to be talking about tonight. And along the way, we should see something about explosions, something about dust, and something about robots. And uh, the word transient should also uh, be something that means something by the end, um, as you'll see in more than one sense. So, the plan. Um, I'm going to give you a whistle-stop tour of my career in astronomy uh, in less than an hour. Uh, it'll include places I've worked, some of the people I've worked with, a few bits of the science along the way, um, and some of the spin-offs. We've heard a little bit about some of the spin-offs and some of the, the, the uh, uh, adventures that this has led to. But before I do, um, this is a public lecture. Some people here know a heck of a lot about astronomy. Um, some people here know not so much. So, for those who are uh, 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 not so familiar with some of this, I thought I'd set the scene by giving you a sense of scale. So this is, and I should also turn the lights down a little bit, actually. So this is the nearest star to uh, the Earth. This is the Sun, the center of the solar system. Uh, it's uh, burning hydrogen in its core, converting into helium, and giving out um, energy. And without the sun, obviously, we, we wouldn't be here. Um, it is by far the largest object in the solar system. You could fit a million Earths inside the sun. But it's a fairly ordinary star, a fairly active place. This is obviously a speeded up time lapse moving. We come out from the sun, past Mercury and Venus planets. We come to the special place that we inhabit here now, which is the Earth. And this is a picture taken from a spacecraft on its way to uh, Jupiter, the Galileo mission, looking back at the Earth-Moon system. And as we move through distant scales, the Earth is about 150 million kilometers from the Sun. The number of zeros we'd have to put on if we ta start talking about uh, kilometers all the time uh, becomes quite ridiculous. So we'll talk in light travel times. So the Earth is eight and a half light seconds from, uh, light minutes rather, from the Sun. Uh, with light traveling at about 300,000 kilometers per second. So eight and a half light minutes for light to get from the sun to the earth, and the moon is about a light second away. And then at the speed of light, if you go through the solar system, past the planets, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, Pluto being demoted to being not quite a planet anymore, um, it's a, a few hours to get out to the distance of, uh, of Neptune. So light travel time, is uh, a few hours to the furthest planet that we know of in the solar system. And then the, to the nearest star, it's actually four and a quarter light years to the nearest star other than the Sun. And that's a star called Proxima Centauri it's in the southern hemisphere. You can't see it from here. But these are a group of stars which you can see from the northern hemisphere. This is a Pleiades cluster of stars. This is about 380 light years away, so it's taking light 380 years from, to get from this cluster, which you can easily see with the naked eye um, uh, in Taurus. And um, uh, this is a, a relatively young cluster of stars. These stars were born at the same time. They're still relatively close together in space. And uh, uh, you can see some dust. Uh, much of that dust is actually between us and those stars rather than being near to them. But some of the dust uh, you can see there uh, is reflecting and scattering light. And that's interstellar dust, dust I'll be talking about in various guises as we go through the talk. So the Sun is a fairly ordinary star, thank goodness, otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here now. It's behaved in much the same way for billions of years and allowed evolution to come to the point we are now with intelligent life on the Earth, so, that, so they tell us. Um, and it will last burning hydrogen to helium for another four or five billion years into the future. When it comes to the end of its days, it will throw off its outer layers, and the core of the star, the core of the sun, will be left as a white dwarf, illuminating 
um, before it gets to the white dwarf stage at least, the star in the middle, this hot star as it is at that stage, illuminating the outer layers as they expand out into space, forming one of these beautiful so-called planetary nebulae. So it goes out with a bit of a poof at the end of its uh, lifetime. On the other hand, uh, and we'll talk a bit about white dwarfs later on, they're objects which uh, typically are about the size of the Earth, but some, the really massive ones, are actually smaller, down to the size of asteroids. Um, uh, a star that is much more massive than the Sun, for example, can end its days in a catastrophic way as a supernova explosion, completely blowing itself to bits, and maybe leaving either a neutron star or a black hole. That is a so-called type 2 supernova. There are different uh, types of supernovae. I'll be talking about those that we think originate from getting to the point where you have a white dwarf, where mass is being added to the white dwarf, and it goes beyond a certain point, called the Chandrasekhar mass, roughly, uh, and then explodes as what's called a Type 1a supernova. I'll talk more about those later on. This is a supernova that went off in a companion galaxy of the Milky Way, a small companion galaxy called the Large Magellanic Cloud, back in 1987. And I remember the flurry of excitement when that happened. It's the nearest supernova uh, that we know of to the Earth for several hundred years. Well, I've talked about planets, stars. Stars in uh, the Milky Way, um, uh, like our Sun, the Milky Way, if we were able to look down upon it, it's actually a galaxy, a spiral galaxy of stars. So this, if this were the Milky Way, we would be sitting uh, on, a, on a planet that, uh, going around a star, uh, the Sun, somewhere out on uh, a spiral arm-ish, um, about uh, 30,000 light years from the middle of this giant spiral structure. And the whole thing is about 150,000 light years across. And then the whole of this is rotating such that at our, at our distance from the center, I think it goes around once every 200 million years or so. So we've been around once since the very primitive dinosaurs were, were knocking around. You see as well as the stars, which all blend into each other, and there are something like uh, uh, 100 to 200,000 million stars in our galaxy. Uh, you'll see dust lanes crossing the, uh, uh, in among the spiral arms, where new stars are being formed. And those dust lanes block out the light of stars um, and gas behind them. As we're looking further out into the universe, we see, in fact, billions of galaxies, some of which cluster together, as in this cluster of galaxies, which is um, 100 million light years or more away. Um, and some of these galaxies are interacting with each other. You can see that some are uh, elliptical galaxies, some are spiral galaxies like our own. And then, uh, a few years ago now, the Hubble Space Telescope uh, stared at a, an unremarkable patch of sky above the bowl of the Big Dipper and took about 150 orbits to stare at that patch of sky, so it went incredibly faint. So therefore, looking uh, potentially at very, very distant objects, and it was a bit of a surprise when they uh, analyzed the data and found a field full of galaxies. And these galaxies, um, some of the galaxies here, the light left them uh, two and a half billion years ago, and others 10 billion years ago. So you really are, as we said in one of the... Uh, introductory talks, you really are looking back in time uh, because of that finite light travel time. The further away you look, the further back in time you're looking. And uh, because the universe is thought to be about 13.8 billion years old, you're looking a good, goodly fraction of that. Not as far as we can actually see, uh, but you're looking a, a goodly fraction of that distance back in time. So that's the Cook's tour of the universe. I often get asked when I give an astronomy talk, where's the center of the universe then? Well, because we're actually in the expanding universe, we're in the Big Bang, it doesn't actually uh, make much sense to say the center is over there, or over there, or over there. But to me, the center of the universe is very easily defined. I'm going to tell you about my first 21 orbits around the sun. Center of the universe is a little town in... <laughs> 
<laughs> North Staffordshire called Leek. And uh, this is where uh, I was born and was brought up. And um, I was very lucky to uh, go to a, uh, uh, a school, Westwood High School, um, in Leek. And um, it's great that my old maths teacher, Martin Edwards, is here tonight. So, uh, um, uh, and uh, this is, uh, was particularly a special place because both my mother and my elder sister went to this school when it was still a girls' grammar school. I went there in the second year of comprehensive education. And above my year, uh, there was still the... Um, uh, girls grammar school girls so it was quite a it's quite a good school to go to <laughs> <coughs> I studied hard I also uh, played the drums and uh, this is my uh, my group called the supernatural um, and uh, one of them uh, Chris Ellis here uh, became a professional musician and is a professional musician in Australia to this day uh, since then, I learned how to sit properly on a, a drum stool rather than on a, a piano stool there. Um, and the thing about this photograph is that I know this was taken in July of 1969. And this links very much to some of the inspiration that uh, many of us had because of this, the Apollo missions. And I haven't actually wired this up for sound, so whether you'll be able to hear this or not, I don't really know. Um, well, whether it even plays, it's not going to play. Oh well, anyway. Um, but the Apollo missions um, really inspired uh, my generation. Um, it was an incredibly exciting time um, to watch these pioneering and extremely hazardous, we didn't really know at the time how hazardous these, these missions really were, uh, explorations of the moon. So they first landed on the moon in July of 1969, and this is Apollo 17, which is the last moon mission, um, and was in December of 1972, when I was in the uh, upper sixth at school. I left there, went to University of Leeds, and did physics, um, mainly because my physics teacher had been to uh, University of Leeds and uh, uh, it seemed a, a good place, so I went there and uh, specialised in the final year in uh, some astrophysics. Then I um, applied for PhD places and I accepted the one that came from Kiel. Being a bit of a home bird and also wanting to maintain this tradition of going to places with double E's in them, <laughs> went to the University of Kiel. And I uh, set out, first of all, on a project to observe transient phenomena on the surface of the moon. These are flashes of light that have been seen, particularly around the edges of the uh, lunar craters. Um, I'll explain later on that actually during the process of choosing what I was really going to do, I, I uh, dropped that project, but uh, it, all, it led to me meeting for the first time Patrick Moore, who I've known right the way up to uh, his, his death a couple of years ago. Um, but it also meant that um, I got my hands on uh, a decent size, not, not huge, but a decent sized telescope for the first time. Um, and this was the Thornton Reflector at Keele Observatory. I should, I should apologise for the fact that I don't think I've ever given a talk with so many photographs of me in it. <laughs> um, I should also say that, um, as Jill has said to me, you presumably grew into that jumper eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, um, the Thornton reflector, I remember Nye and I um, found that it wasn't aligned properly. We had to use pneumatic rams to actually move the whole thing around. Um, so uh, uh, we did get it going, and it's, it's, <coughs> it's, uh, it's still very much in use to this day. I moved on to rather larger telescopes as time went on. Okay, I remember though, uh, it must have been um, spring of 1977 when Nye Evans, um, who's here um, from the University of Kiel, um, he was a child prodigy, <laughs> as you can see, he was my PhD supervisor and he, he still looks uh, younger than me, uh, <laughs> but um, he came back from an RES meeting and he said he'd heard about um, these 
uh, effects, faster than light effects, um, and I think these would have been related to active galactic nuclei, I guess, at that time, came back and uh, said there, there's, um, you know, you can work out what is going on in these things. Would you be interested in, in perhaps uh, pursuing this? And just to explain a little bit of the background to this, a NOVA, and well, I'll tell you a bit more about what NOVA are in, in a few minutes, uh, a so-called new star appeared in Perseus in 1901. It was discovered by a Scottish clergyman walking home from church uh, called Thomas Anderson. He noticed that the constellation of Perseus had changed. There was a bright new star where there hadn't been a star before. He thought at first that other people must have noticed this. Uh, he got in touch with the Royal Greenwich Observatory eventually and found that nobody had noticed it. He was the first one. That was in February of 1901. And then a few months later, more gradually with time, uh, the sky was, this bit of the sky was being photographed. The nova itself is right in the middle of that black splodge. And there's a lot of so-called nebulosity around it. And these are plates, the original plates that we scanned, we digitized. This one hasn't come out quite as well. But anyway, there's, there's various features here. And this particular this feature, for example, the chevron, which is also down here between those crosshairs, although you can't see it too well. It was realized even in 1902 uh, by Captain that the velocity of expansion of that feature and other features was greater than the speed of light. And a, a heroic spectrum or um, a heroic astronomer took a spectrum that lasted 34 hours of exposure, opening and closing the shutter on the telescope, because you can't, you can't expose in daylight. Um, he showed that the spectrum of the brightest parts of the light of this uh, nebulosity, this superlight nebulosity, was actually uh, very similar to that of the NOVA a few days after outburst. So it seemed to be echoing what the NOVA had been doing sometime soon after outburst, but a year or so later. So what was going on? Well, here we have a, a schematic with, uh, here's your observer, in this case, the Space Telescope. The NOVA goes bang, and you see that uh, light coming towards you. And then as time goes on, uh, that uh, reflected light, or re-emitted light of circumstellar dust, spreads out through the nebula on the surface, or filling in, a paraboloid of revolution about the nova itself. Because um, to see uh, that all these times being the same, i.e. the flash, the light travel time from here to there to you, from here to there to you, etc., must be the same. And that's, that's, uh, uh, that defines a parabola. Or more exactly an ellipse, but uh, a parabola will, will do for now. And here's just a, a section through that. This is from my PhD thesis. Um, and uh, just interestingly, I think it's MN, which has the... Uh, the my maths teacher will uh, correct me on this, but I think this is called the semilatus rectum, which is not something that you say too often. <laughs> um, and uh, so the nova goes bang, and uh, uh, light comes and, uh, for example, is reflected or absorbed and re-emitted here and then comes to you as the observer in the distance. And it turns out that if this is a plane of dust here, then the expansion velocity that you see uh, of this expanding parabola as it cuts that plane is faster than the speed of light for every um, plane that's in front of the nova. So that explained the faster than light effect. Um, this is, hopefully this will work, Oh, no. This movie doesn't work. Okay. Well, this is um, light echoes around uh, a Nova-like object called V838 Mon. And here, this, uh, the movie shows these expanding rings of material uh, as time goes on. And uh, it's a beautiful space telescope uh, image. Well, this movie works. So, um, just backtracking a little bit about Novi, the object in the middle causing the flash that either 
uh, that illuminates the, the dust cloud. Uh, a nova light curve it comes from something that's fairly faint, uh, rapidly rises, and declines away again over a period of weeks, months, or even years. <coughs> the rise is usually much more rapid than the decline. And here we have um, Liverpool telescope observations of a nova going off in the Andromeda Nebula, this galaxy, the nearest large neighbor galaxy to ourselves, about two and a quarter million light years away. And you can see the nova coming up in the uh, field of, uh, of the detector. Well, what is a nova? Um, comes from Latin for a new star, but they're anything but new systems. This is a simulation of what we now uh, know to be the system in most novae. You have a star similar to the sun, perhaps a little less massive than the sun, uh, a bit cooler than the sun, in close proximity to a white dwarf star, the dead core of a star that's gone through its evolutionary phases and left this thing about the size of the Earth or slightly smaller. The two stars are so close together that material is falling from the outer layers of the companion star onto the surface of the white dwarf. It doesn't fall straight down because the whole system is rotating. It forms a disk. And that material eventually lands on the surface of the white dwarf, builds up a hydrogen-rich layer, and then you get uh, an out-of-control, a runaway thermonuclear explosion on the surface of the white dwarf, throws material into space at up to thousands of kilometers per second. Um, maybe a Jupiter mass of material into, into space. And the whole thing can occur again. It doesn't blow the system to bits. It can occur again for so-called classical novae between 1,000 and 100,000 year um, on those sort of time scales. And if you look a few decades later, and this is a, uh, a nova that went off in 1967, um, look a few decades later, you can see the expanding ejector coming out. And this is, uh, if we look now at where G.K. Purr is in the sky, we see uh, the G.K. Purr remnant looking very much like a, a firework, an explosion. You can see that uh, very clearly here. And this material is spreading out into space and, and will gradually fade away again. And then the nova, at some point in the future, will recur. But for most novae, that recurrence time is very long. But if the white dwarf is massive enough and you're piling enough material onto the white dwarf uh, <coughs> per second, that recurrence time comes down to historical time scales, and we end up with what's called a recurrent nova, which I'll come on to in a minute. First of all, uh, I should explain a bit about how we first applied our light echo model to novae. Well, here's a slightly complicated diagram, but uh, basically this is uh, brightness up here, and this is time along here. And this is how the brightness of a nova goes. There's a, a very fast rise and then a gradual <coughs> decline. And in some cases, there's a dip and then the final decline in the visual part of the spectrum. But the first UV satellite observations of a nova back in 1970 showed that this is very misleading. If you look in the UV, the UV comes up as the visual goes down. And then if you were to look in the X-ray, this comes up uh, later still. Now what's happening here is as the mass loss rate from the white dwarf, as the ejector uh, mass loss rate uh, decreases, you see further and further down into that envelope and you see to hotter and hotter regions. So you're seeing to, um, uh, from the visible through uh, the peak then moves into the UV and ultimately when you see right the way down to the white dwarf surface itself, uh, you're looking in the, uh, the X-ray. Well, what's this infrared rise here? What's that? Well, it was uh, apparent, again, about 1970, that this is emission from dust grains uh, in the vicinity of the nova. And we first applied our light echo models to trying to explain this infrared rise in terms of a pre-existing envelope of grains around the nova that were now heated up and re-emitted. Uh, and there was some delay because of the time delays involved, so the infrared peak was later. And there were a few other subtleties to this as well. Um, 
We eventually realized that that was not the case. What in fact is happening is as the ejector spread out and cool, dust grains form in the ejector, they fog out the light of the underlying um, uh, so-called pseudo-photosphere, and there's a big dip in that light, and then as the uh, infrared rises, as the dust cloud thins out, the optical re-emerges uh, again and then finally declines away. And ultimately, uh, you'll get a radio source because this is an ionized um, ejector. The, the ejector are ionized, they spread out, they expand, and uh, there's a peak uh, rather later on from the ionized uh, ejector in the radio. Okay, so um, it didn't work. Our light echo models didn't actually work for Novi, but we were the first, uh, Nye and myself, were the first to use light echo models to explain what happens in supernovae that show infrared excesses, where in type 2 supernovae you do have a pre-existing or can have a pre-existing uh, circumstellar envelope that uh, is heated up, the grains are heated up by the, the flash of the supernova and re-emit, and there the light echo models were very su successful. Okay, well, I'll, I'll uh, just now uh, tell you a little bit about my first real observing trip. This was to South Africa in uh, 1982, and uh, I was away for a total of three weeks, uh, and it was absolutely coincident with the start of the Falklands War. So as uh, the task force was leaving Britain, I was stuck up in the Karoo listening to radio, the South African Broadcasting Corporation, uh, filtering out all the news. And we got a very, very distorted view of what was happening uh, in the rest of the world, and particularly at this very uh, tense time. But um, so, uh, it was an incredibly um, interesting cultural trip. Of course, apartheid was still going at that time. And uh, there, were, there were numerous occasions where we just couldn't, uh, you know, it really was uh, hard to understand how that country operated in that way. Nonetheless, um, the SAO was a, uh, a bastion of democracy, if you like, within uh, South Africa as it was at that time. We were using 1.9 metre telescope, which uh, when I say 1.9 metre, I mean the main mirror is 1.9 metres across. It's uh, a great leviathan of a telescope. Um, uh, it's in this dome over here, and there are some smaller telescopes, as it turns out, in these domes here. A few years later, and I, myself, and others took over all four of those telescopes to observe um, various types of objects, including Novi, and also pre-main sequence stars and so on. Um, but on this observing trip, I had 14 nights. We had half of one clear night. It rained the rest of the time. Saw a lot of the Karoo in daylight, um, but in that half night, we actually got enough the observations to get two papers out. Uh, one was on uh, a Nova. So uh, when I came back, and uh, having been away for three weeks with Jill, uh, expecting our first child, and she said, uh, did it go well? Oh, yeah, it was, you know, really was, it was, was it worth going? Oh, yeah, 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 it was worth going, yes, yes. And of course, ultimately, yes, we got the two papers out, so it was obviously worth going. But it led to various other observing trips um, in the future. Well, um, there was serendipity involved in going to Kiel and to uh, meeting Nye and doing the projects that I did. There was serendipity involved in uh, the next place um, I went to, which was Los Alamos Lab. Nye and I went on a, a visit to University of Cambridge and we met um, in the library there Franz Cordover um, who uh, worked at Los Alamos and Los Alamos is a very unusual place, it's a town of 20,000 people with a lab which in those days employed 7,000 people and there were 1,200 PhDs in the town so it's a very unusual place uh, to be, a fabulous climate, and that's partly why uh, Robert Oppenheimer uh, chose uh, to locate the lab there. Um, and that's obviously where the atomic uh, bomb was first developed in the 1940s. I have to say, I didn't work on anything sinister, so, uh, <laughs> um, uh, but there's a, there was a lot of spin-offs there from uh, medical physics to the Space Astronomy Group, which is the group that I worked in which originally was looking for violations of the test ban treaties in space. 
Um, we soon became very Americanized, and uh, this, is, this is Jill and Elizabeth. Um, I had to tell Jill, uh, she knew this, that uh, I had to accept the job or decline it on the day, the last date was the day Elizabeth was born. And Elizabeth was five months old when we went to, to Los Alamos, so uh, Jill had never been to the US before, so it's a credit to her that um, she stuck with it and came with me. Um, eventually Matthew, our son, was born and he came out to Los Alamos when I was working as a consultant there in subsequent summers. My boss was Franz Cordova, who has risen to great heights. She's now director of the National Science Foundation in the United States. So Franz Cordova was uh, president of a couple of US universities, uh, very high up in NASA and now is, is uh, head honcho of the NHF, NS, NSF. Uh, worked with some data from the Einstein X-ray observatory um, we showed, um, for the first time, conclusively, uh, the existence of uh, scattered X-ray halos around objects using light echo effects. I used what's called the Real Man's Telescope, the 36-inch Crosley at Lick Observatory. This telescope started life in Wakefield in, in the 1880s. And by 1896, it was fully dismantled and shipped out to California, where the weather is slightly better. Uh, a bit like the human body, I suspect that hardly any of this telescope is original. It's all gradually been replaced, apart from some of the steelwork that you see down there. But when we used it, you had to still move it around by hand. Show your age here, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> But also, I, I was involved in a project which was um, uh, a civilian sort of spin-off of uh, a failed part of the Star Wars initiative, most of which did fail. Um, and this was to uh, um, put a simulated dust cloud, interstellar dust cloud, or a cloud of simulated interstellar grains in low Earth orbit and observe it. And this would, was to be from the combined radiation, uh, combined release and radiation effects satellite, CRESS. Well, uh, in, after a couple of years in Los Alamos, I was uh, fortunate enough to get a, an advanced fellowship back in, in Manchester. And ultimately, this was transferred to Preston, and I uh, got my first permanent job in Preston. So we continued our okey-cokey around the northwest of England. Um, I went on observing trips to Hawaii. Um, we choose exotic sounding lo locations, as you know, but uh, we choose them for all the best astronomical reasons. I used the uh, 3.8 meter Euker telescope, and this was uh, uh, to observe dust in the Taurus molecular cloud. And let's see whether, now this isn't going to work either. Um, Taurus molecular cloud uh, is a region, a dusty region in the constellation of Taurus, and uh, we were observing the composition of the dust, looking for the signatures of water ice, which is seen at uh, a wavelength of 3.1 microns. And this is one of uh, the results. And uh, you can quite clearly see here uh, the data in the background. This is a, a signature of water ice, and this is a model fit <coughs> that we did uh, with uh, a mantle of water ice on a silicate a grain. Grain sizes similar to those of particles of smoke. And uh, we showed that uh, from this you could work out the thermal history of the grains by where, where, the, uh, sorry, where uh, the peak actually is and what the shape of the uh, feature is. And you can see on this side that it doesn't fit very well and this is because there are rather more complex molecules in that mantle as well. At that time, and this was alluded to by Tim O'Brien in uh, that uh, lovely video that was shown early, earlier on, an object, a nova, went off called RS off. And uh, this had had known outbursts prior to 1985 uh, several times. So instead of just going off once in human history, it had been seen to go off several times. And it went off in 1985, while I was at the University of Manchester. And the reason I was interested in this object, I was asked when I was defending my thesis why I'd mentioned this object at all. And it was because 
uh, it was known to be, or thought to be, surrounded by um, a dusty wind. And therefore, when the explosion went off and this wind was illuminated, uh, our light echo models could be used to model the infrared emission uh, that we expected to see from this object. But it became rather more interesting than that when it uh, underwent its outburst in 1985. It was realized that the ejected material coming out from the white dwarf, coming out at a few thousand kilometers per second, would impact that red giant wind and shock it to very high temperatures indeed. There would also potentially be acceleration of electrons towards, uh, to near uh, light velocities and if that, if that also is, uh, if there's a magnetic field there, which inevitably there will be, that can lead to what's called synchrotron emission. So I expected this to be a radio source. And we used a uh, forerunner of the e in array, which is centered on the uh, Jodrell Bank nowadays, which is called the Mark I, Mark II interferometer. This is using two telescopes to act like one in the radio. And... Um, uh, through the auspices of Richard Davis, who's still a, a friend and colleague um, at the University of Manchester, we undertook our radio observations, and lo and behold, it turned out to be a bright radio source and increasing in brightness all the time. We only managed to get onto it on day uh, 19 after the outburst in January 1985. We also expected this very hot ejector, or the, the very hot uh, shocked material in the wind, to emit at X-rays, and Europe was flying a satellite called ExoSat at that stage. We managed to persuade them, took a lot of persuading, to observe RS off, which they did. 55 days after outburst was the first observation. This is medium energy and low energy channels, uh, or low energy detectors. Um, and uh, we then got uh, the uh, tremendous total of about six observation points. But it turned out to be one of the brightest low energy sources, at least, that Exosat observed. And it looked like our um, assumptions as to what was going on were actually correct. We fast forward to the next outburst in 2006. By this stage, we'd got really very capable astronomical facilities indeed. And of course, they continue to grow in capability. And one of these is the SWIFT satellite, which was launched in 2004. It has, uh, as the name implies, the capability to react sw very swiftly to things that change in the sky. Uh, and it has an X-ray telescope, which was pointed at RS off within three days. And what we saw was this. Now, um, I, I don't think this movie is going to necessarily work either. Oh, it might do. Um, but if it does, then what, uh, what you'll see in the top panel is the spectrum in X-rays as this green marker moves past the observed points, the counts uh, down here. You see the spectrum from low energy X-rays to high energy X-rays. And at this end is where you're seeing the shocked emission. And then something else uh, appears there. So let's see whether it will actually work. No, it's not going not to play ball. Anyway, what we, what we saw was an evolving spectrum such that at the uh, low energy end, the uh, soft X-ray emission comes up, and at the high energy end, at the first few points, you see what is uh, emission from uh, the shock. And what this is, this is this, uh, the shocked emission we understood very well, uh, the uh, low energy emission, which eventually became much brighter than the shocked higher energy emission. This is a so-called super soft source, which in initially was very variable and then plateaued out. The super soft source is where you're seeing right down to the white dwarf still burning material on its surface at a high rate. Then that eventually turns off and uh, uh, then there's a decay away to back to some sort of quiescent state. And from the time scale of nuclear burning here, you can work out how massive the white dwarf is. And it turns out that this white dwarf is approaching uh, the Chandrasekhar mass. Not quite there, but is approaching it. 
and uh, we believe that material is net being added between outbursts. Some of it's lost, but more is added than is lost. And so the mass of the white dwarf is growing, and eventually, uh, a few other things need to be correct for this to, uh, to happen, eventually uh, the object would explode as a type 1a supernova. We're also able to use the uh, very long baseline array in the radio. These are telescopes that stretch from uh, Hawaii across to the US Virgin Islands, forming one large radio telescope with the ability to observe objects in great spatial detail. Remember we just had a few radio points before. Now we we're able to get a lot of radio data points, but also to image the system. And this is what we saw. At 13.8 days, a ring of emission. And you can measure the temperature of this emission. And uh, just by coincidence, it turns out to be roughly the same as the thermal emission that we expected from the, from the shock. Uh, and the shocked material uh, uh, has temperatures of tens of millions of degrees. The center, the core of the sun, is only 16 million or whatever degrees. Um, so this is, the shocks are much hotter than that. But in the radio, you're actually seeing non-thermal emission from these, uh, from electrons uh, gyrating around magnetic fields, giving rise to uh, synchrotron emission. Just to give you an idea of the size scales we're talking about here, these are the orbits of the planets if you were looking at that distance. So at a distance of 5,000 light years, w this ring <coughs> we're seeing its structure on solar system size scales. So this, I, I think, is, is very impressive. And we're also able to use the Space Telescope um, to image at about uh, 155 days the remnant. And we found by this stage it had evolved into a bipolar structure, which uh, one of my ex-PhD students, Valerio Ribeiro, who's here in the audience tonight, has come over from the Netherlands, uh, modelled as this uh, dumbbell-shaped expanding uh, geometry. And the expansion velocities are, at this end, are about 5,000 kilometers per second. And the binary system is sitting rather smaller than that, but sitting in the middle in that sort of orientation. OK. And so, to Liverpool. <laughs> at the heart of what we do, these days is computing and to become a Starlink node as I said earlier on I arrived in 1992 um, and uh, was, was um, uh, asked or um, I guess I was I guess I was headhunted actually to come and um, uh, to come and head up physics and to start astronomy here um, and I arrived um, I remember my office was actually a corner of um, a lab uh, with a very nice chair, <laughs> but no telephone. Uh, in those days, we had, no, um, we had no degree program, we had no research, we had no computing facilities, dedicated to astronomy at least. Um, uh, we didn't have the journals in the libraries, etc., etc. It really was ground zero. But very quickly, we gathered around a, a, an excellent team of people, and after a couple of years, uh, we uh, were... Uh, very pleased to open our Starlink node. And uh, you see in the background here is a young Tim O'Brien. You might recognize this character here. Uh, and Alan Scott, our then computer manager, is, is here tonight as well. So Patrick Moore is there cutting the cake, but uh, the photographer took a rather unfortunate picture. <laughs> Luckily, this didn't get beyond the Starlink bulletin. <laughs> a few years later, we moved over to 12 Keys. The group continued to grow. And then uh, we moved into our uh, new home uh, uh, two and a half years or so ago, uh, just up the road here in the science park. And now there are more than 80 staff and research students uh, although we're research-led, we do technology development, teaching and outreach, you've heard about. 
We have unique joint degrees with uh, our colleagues at the University of Liverpool and also distance learning all the way up to MSc level. But um, our major uh, project, which we heard a little bit about earlier on and uh, formed the uh, uh, image that you saw the movie on the first slide, the Liverpool Telescope came about because of what I've called astropolitics. While I was still in Preston in 1988 uh, there was a research council committee visit to uh, the university and everybody had to stand up and say a few words about their research area, five minutes. And research area Novi, um, the way that conventional telescopes operate is that you apply for time, say six months in advance, if you get through the peer review, you get the time, typically you get three nights of which you may lose one to weather or technical problems. You come back and you analyze your data. That's great for most programs, but if something goes bang now and you want to get onto it and you want to observe it systematically for days, weeks and months thereafter, it's not very good. So what was proposed was what was then called an automated monitoring telescope, which could react quickly to transient things in the universe, could observe them for um, uh, weeks or uh, days, weeks, months, years even, as long as it was scientifically interesting. This was in the ground-based plan in 1989. A bit, a bit more serendipity was that I was on a committee of what was then SER, uh, was still, yeah, SERC in those days, um, and met Neil Parker, who was Director of Technology at the Royal Greenwich Observatory, and um, he said they had a design for what they called the Future Small Telescope, which is this telescope here, which featured on the cover of this uh, conference proceedings that I was uh, privileged to edit. And at the same time, um, we got together and decided okay, we would use this future small telescope and see whether we could build our own telescope rather than buying one in from the United States. And we started a campaign to go out to companies and individuals and so on to raise the funds for our robotic telescope. This was our, um, uh, our offer, if you like. The robotic telescope project, a unique opportunity to invest in the future of science. And we failed. However... Liverpool became an Objective One region uh, and there was money around from European Regional Development Fund uh, to foster technological industries um, from the European Social Fund to upskill uh, the workforce and so on and together with the Royal Greenwich Observatory we put forward a bid which failed the first time but was successful the second time and ultimately, we started the project that I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment. But why robotic? We can repeat the observations on any time scales. The operational costs are less. The capital cost is less because you don't need things like toilets. As those who go to the uh, Liverpool Telescope on the Palmer know, we, we borrow the toilet of the Belgian telescope next door. Um, there's consistency of observational setup. More efficient observing, uh, much more efficient than a human observer, and it addresses many important problems in what we call, grandly call the time domain astrophysics, including transient sources. And we also realized, as I said uh, earlier on, that we could use this for public engagement. We could interleave public engagement observations, what became the National Schools Observatory, in among the program of a robotic telescope. So, with great support from the university, the university at all levels um, and all facets of the university from finance through um, um, HR, through um, estates um, and with uh, the input obviously of the scientists and recruiting engineers, we, we set up a company, Telescope Technologies Limited and this was TTL, that was on the 12 Keys site next to where we used to have the institute. This is inside TTL and this is me before anything was in there except concrete blocks on which telescopes would be built, directing the troops. Um, they are taking not a blind bit of notice of me. 
It's either that or it's a spot the telescope competition <laughs> where we've airbrushed out the telescope and everybody's looking in a different direction so that you're, you're fooled as to where you're going to put your cross. But come a couple of years later, this is what the inside of TTL looked like. We eventually built five large uh, telescopes, some of them fully robotic, but the LT was the prototype. We also built an enclosure, which was uh, built in Camel Lairds, a fully opening enclosure. And that's my colleague Dave Carter, who's in the audience tonight. Uh, this was not an easy task, I have to say. But we, maybe we can talk about this over coffee afterwards. But the enclosure, um, uh, Aldi Robots, who was part and party uh, to all of this, um, I once said, never be a pioneer. Well, we were pioneering here with the uh, fully opening enclosure. And it was rather more um, of an interesting experience than any of us thought it would be. Anyhow, along the way, we met very many uh, memorable, uh, uh, we had many memorable occasions, met many uh, people. This goes all the way from the launch event with Michael Heseltine right through to the opening of our new uh, building, uh, support building on La Palma uh, a couple of years ago. One of the proudest moments, obviously, must be uh, when uh, we were awarded the Queen's Anniversary Prize, which was mentioned earlier on, and this is myself and uh, then Vice Chancellor Michael Brown, who I'm pleased to see is in the audience tonight with his wife, Andrea. Um, and at the same time, uh, my association with Patrick Moore grew because he actually, we persuaded him to be chair of our fundraising committee. And also, I was privileged to appear on the Sky at Night with him uh, several times. And here is one of the uh, recording, just past one of the editing sessions, actually, down in his study in Selsey in Sussex. Uh, very unusual character. Um, his house was uh, a throwback in time to the 1960s, uh, stacked full of uh, every sort of drink you can think about. Um, Tim O'Brien went down there to film um, uh, an episode about light echoes and uh, we arrived very late at night. Patrick greets us in this multicolored caftan, um, which was quite a sight to behold. He immediately said, uh, have you eaten? And we said, well, yeah, um, and he said, right, I'll order a takeaway. So we ordered a curry for everybody. We had this big curry and then we had various drinks and the next morning it seemed like a good idea at the time. The next morning when we were about to uh, record, Tim, Hunt, Tim and I had to walk down to the beach to get some fresh air to come back again to be in a fit state to, uh, to record the programme. But quite a character. So the Liverpool Telescope is on the island of La Palma in the Canaries, which is that island there. It's, um, uh, and this fooled, uh, or used to perplex rather, the uh, Objective One people in Liverpool um, because they thought of course from the name at least that this was going to be in Liverpool and no no it's actually several thousand miles away on the island of La Palma it sits uh, at the International Observatory site and here is uh, a movie of the telescope now as you've seen before opening its fully opening opening enclosure the world's largest robotic telescope it has to be because it was in the Guinness Book of Records uh, gives you an idea of the scale of the thing. That's, uh, that's me um, by the side of the telescope. Uh, it was a great uh, team effort uh, by everyone concerned to get to the point of this telescope operating so successfully now for over 10 years. And I pay tribute to everybody who's, who's been involved in that, including support from Science and Technology Facilities Council. And as mentioned earlier on, the representatives here tonight from STFC. It sits in the International Observatory site. Um, it's a national facility of the UK, mainly for research, conducting programs all the way from nearby objects, comets, all the way through to cosmology, distant supernovae, for example. Looking at variability on 10 millisecond up to 10 year time scales. In any, in any one year, we'll typically have 100 users of the telescope from 30 institutions in 10 countries. It's part of a global network of telescopes. TTL was uh, bought out by the retiring technical director of Google, who, for his retirement, 
uh, decided to set up a global network of telescopes and he uh, bought the two Falks telescopes. Uh, one is in Australia and one is in Hawaii. And we have time as of right on those two telescopes and we make use of that together with other telescopes around the globe as a, a global network. And, as was said earlier on, um, we knew from the offset that we could uh, potentially interleave professional <coughs> observations with those from schools and thereby give school, kill, school kids the thrill <coughs> of working with a front rank research instrument thousands of miles away on the top of a mountain in the Canaries. 2,500 schools, 100,000 plus schools observations as we heard earlier on, and the 100,000th was an observation of the remnants of an explosion, a titanic explosion that took place in 1054 AD and has now led to this supernova remnant called the Crab Nebula. We also want to have a public face to what we were doing and we worked with Mersey Travel to set up a spaceport which has been operating successfully now <coughs> since uh, 2005, so just over 10 years. Uh, and it's the public face of, uh, of what we do, just over the river. Gardens, another adventure, another spin-off, something uh, that I never, as was said right at the beginning, I never thought that um, I would be involved with. Um, as the Guardian said, Mike Boat has grown a few vegetables in the past when uh, they reported us getting the gold medal at Chelsea. Um, a, few a few vegetables in my garden. But um, I'm very pleased to see that my uh, uh, gardening uh, friends are here tonight. Um, we were, through a family friend, asked to become involved, if we wanted to, with uh, a galaxy garden at the RHS uh, flower show at Tatton in 2013. And it wasn't a scale model of the galaxy, but it showed various features of the galaxy, including the spiral arms and the dust lanes and the different types of stars, and an event going on in the middle, which, uh, where a, an approaching cloud of dust and gas was supposed to be torn asunder by the black hole in the center of our galaxy. It wasn't quite as spectacular in the end as a real event, um, uh, but uh, uh, we, at least for the garden itself, we won a gold medal and we won the best, most creative galaxy garden. We had 10,000 people, we clickered them in and out. 10,000 people over those four days actually went through the garden. Uh, and we had uh, Andy, myself and others explaining what was happening, what it was all about to those people. And those are people who, were said, as was said earlier on, who wouldn't necessarily have expected to encounter science at a flower show. Well, on the uh, very last day, when we were taking the whole thing to bits, um, we were sitting in the tent, the rain started to come down, and it was said, what shall we do next? And I said, what about Chelsea? Multiple groans. What shall we do? Dark matter. No clue as to how we'd do that. But um, Howard Miller, who you saw in the previous image, um, and I'll show you again in a moment, um, had uh, has a, a tremendous creative flair and he designed a garden where the path of light from the distant universe is shown uh, to be bent by massive objects through this steel structure and the massive objects are represented by different uh, types of planting and so on. And this dark matter garden, uh, well there were several things that were unique about this but one of which something that's never happened in the whole history of the universe was that there were two professors of astrophysics at the Chelsea Flower Show <laughs> at the same time, uh, Andy Newsom and myself, explaining to the public what was going on. Amazingly, first time at Chelsea, some of the plants here were grown in uh, Dory Miller Howard's, and this is Howard in the middle, Howard's uh, mum's back garden in Ledsham on the Wirral, and Dory is in the audience tonight. Um, not only that, but we won the best in category, and there are only three categories of garden. This was unbelievable. And the RHS, um, we were on TV every night because it was just so unusual. And the RHS audited figures show that the global TV audience aggregate over that week was 211 million people around the globe who saw something of the Chelsea Flower Show 
and many of those would have seen something about the National Schools Observatory Dark Matter Garden, co-sponsored by the university and STFC. And at the end of the show, instead of it all going either into skips or being sold off, it's now been transported to Darsbury Labs, STFC Darsbury Labs, and if you want to actually go and see it, you probably have to apply via the website of Darsbury, but there was an open day at Darsbury on the 9th of July this year. Well, dark matter, a um, bit of a tenuous connection to the next slide, but there is an upcoming space uh, mission called Euclid that the ARI are, are involved in, which will uh, give us the best handle uh, to date on this mysterious uh, entity that makes up something like 85% of the matter content of the universe, and it will also give us a handle on the even more mysterious dark energy that pervades the universe. Euclid um, was one of the high priority missions that we prioritized as part of the Astronet um, project that I was uh, privileged to uh, be the task leader for the infrastructure roadmap which is a roadmap for the development of European astronomy over the next 10 to 20 years. And our roadmap symposium, uh, this is Thijs van der Hulst from Groningen, who, I'm, again, I'm very, very pleased to see is, is here tonight. Um, uh, the roadmap symposium was held down in the uh, convention center down on the docks and was the first major meeting to be held there. They were just gluing down the carpets when we were about to start our symposium, uh, but was nonetheless very successful. It also prioritized uh, facilities like the Square Kilometre Array, Radio Telescope, whose headquarters is at uh, Jodrell Bank, and the European Extremely Large Telescope, which is now well underway to build a telescope with uh, an aperture equivalent to a 39-metre mirror, the largest optical telescope ever built. So what about the present? Well, you probably want uh, a percentage of your money back to com coming to my retirement talk because I'm not as we said, I'm not fully retiring. Um, what am I doing? I'm helping uh, Thailand, that's where my Thai comes from, is Thailand, um, to develop its astronomy program, and they're developing it incredibly rapidly. Um, I'm also still active in research, and here is that Nova GK Persei in 1917. 16 years after the outburst, and here, about 100 years after the outburst, you can see the matter spreading out into space. This is in the X-rays. The, the material is colliding with something down in this southwest quadrant, and it's also uh, a source of non-thermal radio emission. We have uh, a program of observations using the, uh, what is really now the JVLA, very large array in New Mexico, to continue to observe the, the evolution of the radio remnants, which is like a supernova remnant in miniature. We know that the remnant itself is moving in this sort of, as a whole, is moving in this direction. And down here is a concentration of uh, interstellar matter. Uh, this is where the brightest of the light echoes were. So the nova ejector are actually running into material down in this southwest quadrant. And we really want to understand uh, what's going on there. Then we have a program of observations of novae in other galaxies like M31 and M81 uh, led by Mac Matt Darnley, former PhD student, now senior lecturer, who's leading these programs here at JMU. And this week uh, we have in the audience tonight uh, members of a workshop, the Matt and Martin Henze from Barcelona uh, have organized um, looking at this remarkable recurrent nova with this telephone number name M31N 2008 12A. Um, it's, uh, this is the uh, image from the Liverpool telescope on 1st of October 2014. This is on the 2nd. And I believe I'm right in saying that Matt was on the train from home to work on his uh, phone looking at uh, the data from the night before from the Liverpool telescope and spotted that the object had gone into outburst and set in train a whole raft of uh, different observations including some space-based observations from, from Swift um, observing this nova. We now know there have been at least eight 
outbursts in eight years, so it's going off every year. So that means that the white dwarf in this system must be very, very massive, approaching that magic Chandrasekhar mass where the whole thing will blow to bits as a type 1a supernova. Now being followed up by SWIFT, uh, by Hubble Space Telescope, the last outburst was followed up by Hubble Space Telescope, and as I say, it's prime contender as a supernova 1a progenitor. Supernovae type 1a are important for, all th for things from cosmology down to the uh, formation evolution of uh, heavy elements. The other thing I'm working on is uh, Liverpool Telescope 2. Um, caused enough trouble with Liverpool Telescope, so why don't we do it again? Um, Liverpool Telescope 2, with uh, an aim to have this uh, operational by 2021, which is when other major astronomical facilities for the 21st century will be um, in operation. Bigger than the LT, going to fainter objects, moving even faster than the LT, giving us tremendous technical challenges. Uh, partnership with Spain and um, uh, the IEC in Tenerife uh, are very much uh, supporters of, of this project. Uh, Johan Knappen uh, from the IEC is, is in the audience here tonight and is spending a year with us in, in ARI. And there's great interest from Thailand um, putting it, uh, in putting it on their five-year roadmap. Where would, where would it be? On La Palma. Here is uh, the LT and here is the site that LT2 would be on. Uh, that site has already been uh, designated. Well, so I am being kept busy. Um, I'm being kept under con uh, control as well. That uh, I, I'm not going com completely uh, 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 mad on all those things, but um, I'm doing a few other things besides uh, astronomy, including uh, some of my brewing friends are here tonight, so we're doing a bit of brewing. Um, uh, but finally... Um, I'd just like to say, uh, first of all, thank you for the, for the great um, the kind words that were said at the beginning. Thank you to all the people that I've worked with. Um, thanks to everybody uh, who's uh, here tonight. Thanks to all my friends. Um, uh, thank you all. Um, and particularly, thank you... Uh, to Jill, who has been my uh, uh, support and the love of my life. Um, thanks. Thanks to you. <laughs> Thank you.